Be kind. What does that bring to mind when you hear someone to tell you to be kind? Well, if you're religious, you might say, I think there's something about that in the Bible. Uh, I may be giving my age away here, but there was a saying back in the day, be kind, please rewind. That was back in the days nobody could afford a VCR. They were like over a thousand dollars. And you had to go to a Blockbuster or one of those video rental places and you actually had to rent the machine, put a hundred dollar down deposit on the thing, as well as rent the movie. And uh, then you had, of course, go uphill the entire way uh, there and back in the snow. Well, no, I guess it wasn't that bad. But be kind, please rewind. It's all the tapes said that because Nobody wanted to go rent a movie, have the tape ready to go, have their popcorn. They pop it in the machine, and it's all the way at the end. And so you got to rewind it yourself to wait till it gets to the beginning so you can watch the movie. And, and so the, the store wanted you to rewind it before you brought it back so it would be ready for viewing for the next customer. And that was viewed as an act of kindness. Now, I don't know how much people really sold on kindness. It may be that the word kind just rhymed with the word rewind, right? Uh, but it does bring to mind that kindness is going to take more than just the word. We have to have some understanding of how kindness works. What does it look like? Uh, you know, I've always held the door open for people as long as I can remember. It's not a you know male-female kind of thing. You know, we live in an age where there be some women will be upset. How dare you say I can't like, live without the, a man, you know? I can open my own doors. It's like, it's nothing to do with it. I'd hold the door open for anybody uh, because that's just kindness. But, but you could easily envision a society in which holding a door open for somebody was an insult. And in that society, well, you wouldn't want to hold the door open for people unless you wanted to insult them. And so we'll uh, give some thought to some of these things, but the, the thing I really want to begin on is I suspect, and this is the danger of all preachers, you assume people are struggling with the same things that you did when you were younger, and you learn better, so you want to try to spare everybody else making the same mistake. But is kindness not just a synonym for gentleness or niceness, something along that line, just an attitude some kind of positive disposition that we have for people. That is not what the word means. It may mean that in English. Uh, but when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, you notice gentleness is included in the list along with kindness. And so either we're just getting redundant, and some preachers do that. I don't know what the Holy Spirit does without purpose. But it is actually because the word has a little bit different meaning than that. Now, again, I readily concede that we often use the word kindness, and what we really mean is someone is, you know, a very positive and gentle, kindly kind of person, right? So what does it really mean? Well, let's think about the etymology of this word, that is our attribute of kindness that we're going to be talking about here. And I want to start with uh, the English word. Now, that's just because I'm fascinated about words. Uh, you do realize there are other English words that we spell exactly the same way, but we tend to think mean something completely different. Like, what kind of pie would you like? Or what kind of dog is that, right? And that's a completely different kind of kind, but it's not. In fact, it is directly related to the meaning of this word in English. The idea being that Kindness is a reflection of how you treat your own kind. And that reflects a culture in which, hey, these are my people. And when I'm with my people, I treat them nice. I treat them well. Those people over there, they don't deserve it. Right? The word kin, as in kinfolk, it's related also. These are my kinfolk. These are my kind of people. And so kindness originally had this idea of how we treat them. Now, you see, the Bible comes along, and our translations use the word kindness, 
And I, I find this a helpful point because we can expand upon it because clearly the Bible would say that we need to come to understand that in Christ, our concept of who our kin are has changed. We are all children of the one God who has created us all in his image. And if for no other reason but the fact that we are all made in the image of God, we are human beings. We are all of the same kind. And we are therefore to love one another. And if that were not enough, the fact that Jesus Christ died for every single person, without exception, those are the kind of people that we're talking about. And so our parameters of our kind has really been expanded in Christ. There is no such thing as this kind versus that kind. We're all the same kind. And so maybe that'll give us a way of thinking about how, how should we treat one? How would you treat your family? How would you treat your own kind? Well, basically, it's the golden rule. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. That is ultimately going to be the definition of kindness that we're going to see this evening. But there is also, of course, this uh, Greek word that uh, we have that we're working with here. Uh, because the New Testament is written in Greek, not that you get it get all fancy and Greekified, but uh, it's not always going to be apparent when the same word is being used in different passages. And so... I want to start with a basic idea of what the Greek word was, and it actually has the idea of what is useful. And so what is good in that sense? Not good in terms of moral goodness versus moral evil, but what's useful, right? Uh, so you think of Jeremiah chapter 24, when Jeremiah has the vision of the good figs and the bad figs. Again, these are not morally good figs and uh, you know, morally evil figs. Um, these figs that are useful, that they're good to eat, and then figs that are not fit for that purpose. And so I want to begin in Philemon chapter 1 because this is the term that uh, Paul uses to talk about Onesimus. You remember the slave of Philemon? And so he says in Philemon verse 10, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I fathered in my imprisonment, who previously was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. And so this idea that he's a useless slave, now a useful slave. It's the very word we're dealing with here that we often translate as kind. He was a kind slave, an unkind slave. But clearly, it's not talking about a positive disposition and, and being gentle or nice or something like that. It is what is useful and what is not useful. Paul uses this word two more times in 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, to talk about vessels that are useful for the master's service. And in chapter 4, he says for Timothy to bring Mark to him because he finds Mark useful. And so there are several places where you can see that usage, that meaning of the word coming through. But I do think it is appropriate for us to use the word kind as most of our translations do, to translate this term, as long as we understand what kind of kindness that we are talking about. And so to get there, let's uh, go back to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Now, most of the time in the Old Testament, that is when it was translated from the Hebrew into the Greek, this is the Greek word that is used over and over and over again to describe God. And so notice in Psalm 34, and we'll pick up in verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, fear, for to those who fear him, there is no lack of anything. Young lions do without and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come. You children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, did you hear the word kind in any of those verses? <laughs> because it's not there. Because the Hebrew word that is used here in this verse, particularly in verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Right? And when the translators came across verses like this, and there are many of them, dozens of them, 
They, for some reason, chose this word that gets translated in the New Testament, kind. That they thought that that best summed up what was being described here. Now, is it because Greek didn't have any word for good? No. There's plenty of words for good in Greek. But this word is conveying something particular. Again, it's not moral goodness. This statement in verse 8 isn't, oh, you, you need to, to learn and see for yourself that the Lord is a morally upright being. That is not what this verse is saying. What he's saying is, you need to taste and see the good that God has done for you. And it's that sense in which the Lord is good, that he does good, is how we can say it. Now that we know this, well, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we find that Peter is quoting this passage, uh, referring to this passage from Psalm 34. He alludes to or quotes Psalm 34 several times, a very extension quotation of it in chapter 3, from verses 10 through 12. It's also found here at the beginning of chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babies. Crave the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow unto salvation since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And, and you see how this has been converted now from Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's reflected here that how Peter has worded it, phrased it, is using the same word that the translators had used uh, when they translated the Old Testament. And you have tasted that the Lord is kind. You've tasted this kindness of the Lord. And what an amazing thing that is. And so... The idea that we need to recognize is all these descriptions of God as being good, it is the idea that God is kind. And again, not that he's a morally good person in and of himself, although that's true. But the point in every one of these verses is, is that God acts in a way that is good for his people. And so whatever the need is, he meets it. If you're hungry... To do good for a hungry person is to feed them. And if you don't do that good for them, you are no good to them. You are useless for them. But God is not useless. God is good. He does good on behalf of his people. And that's what we're getting at here. And so just to illustrate the number of times that this is said, just in the book of Psalms. Of course, you recognize many of these statements uh, that the, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And again, every single time, it is because of what God has done for his people, for those who fear him, for, for Israel, for those that are upright of heart. All the other ways that this is described to us uh, in uh, the Old Testament. And again, we'll just sample some of these. And the ones I've highlighted, the ones I'll uh, refer to here. So Psalm 25. <clears throat> Psalm 25, what do we find here? Uh, well, in, in the verse 7 and verse 8, both of these verses uh, give us a form of this word. Uh, do not remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoings. Remember me according to your faithfulness for your goodness sake, Lord. The Lord is good and upright, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. And so he speaks of the kindness of the Lord and that the Lord is kind because of the good that he has done for his people. And, and so uh, we mentioned the point that this is particularly a reference to the good that God is doing to the nation of Israel. But if you were to step back and say, well, what good did God do for Israel? If you had to boil it down, there is one good that God has done for Israel that overshadows all the other good things that I mean, everything God did for Israel was good. But the great good that he did was he saved them. He was forgiving and merciful and compassionate, kind in that sense. And so it is particularly in the mercy of God, in his grace and forgiveness, that we see 
the goodness of God. You see that plea here in Psalm 25. We've already read the passage in Psalm 34 and verse 8. Let's turn over to uh, Psalm 86 now and see what is said here. Psalm 86. For you, Lord, are good or kind and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. Therefore, listen, Lord, to my prayer. Give your attention to the sound of my pleading. Again, you see God acting for the good of his people and particularly in the context of his forgiveness. And then in Psalm 100 and uh, verse 5, the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. And you find some form of that several times over the next few of the Psalms. And then finally, Psalm 119. And you notice there are a bunch of these verses that are clustered in the 60s, right? And if you have one of those Bibles that gives you the Hebrew alphabet, most people are familiar with the fact that the reason there's so many verses in this psalm is there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and there are eight lines of poetry for each of the letters, and they each begin with that letter. And so if it were our alphabet in English, the first letter is A, and you'd have eight lines all begin with the letter A, the next eight begin with the letter B, and so on. And so you'll notice that the section here begins in verse 65 and runs through verse 72, and it's the letter Tet, which sounds like a T, because that's a letter T in Hebrew. And so a lot of these lines begin with the Hebrew word for good, which is tov. Maybe one of the few Hebrew words people know. Boker tov is good morning, even in modern Hebrew. And so a lot of good is found in these verses because of the uh, you know, lettering uh, calls for that kind of thing. Uh, also teaching, uh, the word for teach, Torah, related to the word Torah, occurs quite a bit in this section as well. But just notice, in particular verse 68, you are good, and you do good. Teach me your statutes. And here it particularly links the, the goodness of God as a moral quality of his with the actual benefit and practical application of that goodness or kindness that is done for others. And so this is, is, is how we see the kindness of God that is constantly spoken of uh, throughout uh, the Old Testament. Well, next I want us to consider... 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and that's because it has a lot to offer insight about this idea of kindness for a couple of reasons. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul gives us the great chapter on love, basically it says love is everything, love is all there is, love is all that matters, love is the only thing that's going to be left standing at the end. And he gives us a description in verses 4 through 7. And what I've tried to reflect here is how to outline this. A couple of things we might know. To highlight it in yellow, and I hope it shows up on the TV screen, as well as it does my, my laptop here, um, that all these yellow words are verbs. Every description that Paul gives of love is a verb in this chapter. Now, that's not to say you can't describe love with an adjective or some other thing, uh, but Paul wants to choose verbs in order to convey more the act Activity, the behavior of love, how it actu actually you know, demonstrates itself in practical application, as opposed to a feeling. And what I want to suggest is what the Bible has said about kindness is the same thing. It's not a feeling that you have. I'm not saying it's devoid of feeling. But it's not primarily about the feeling. It is about the doing. And what's fascinating is the word love appears four times in this text. The fourth one is in verse 8 where he begins the final paragraph that love does not fail. The third time the word love appears is at the beginning of a long list of things love does not do. Love does not this, 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 and this, but here's some positive things. And then the first two are found with the first two descriptions. And I, I want to suggest to you that is because these first two descriptions of love are the two most important. 
These two are the foundation. And the reason they are so important, as I've noted here, these are the attributes of God, particularly, that are predominantly used. This is how God is described over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. God suffers long, and God kinds. Now, we don't have the verb to kind, and so we can't translate it that literally. And so our versions will say love is kind, or love does kind things, or something like that. I would suggest we just say love does good. Uh, and you also have this kind of ABBA pattern, love, then the verb, the verb for the next phrase, and then ending with the noun again. And that clearly shows that these four words by which the, the verse begins go together. And so God is described overwhelmingly as long-suffering. Now, the phrase as it is reflected in most of our English Bibles is slow to land. And it's first given in that famous story where Moses asked to see the glory of God, and God says, I'll paraphrase here, I know what you're asking for, and I'm going to accommodate you, but you can't see my face and live. But actually the first thing that God says is, I, I will make my goodness pass before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate. And I think that was God's way of saying, I know what you want to see, and you've called it my glory. But that's not my real glory. My real glory you've already seen because I've been merciful and patient and forgiving of the nation of Israel just in the last chapter with the golden calf and all of that foolishness. And so when God makes this arrangement, says, well, I'm going to hide you over here in this crevice, I'm going to pass by you, and then Moses gets to see the backside of God. And there are people who have debated, what in the world is that? It's just, I, I go with John more simply on that when he says in John chapter 1, no man has seen God in any time. And all these statements that people saw God are not to be taken literally. They're accommodative statements about encountering God, but no one's actually ever seen God. And even Moses, who is said to have spoken face-to-face -face with God, didn't actually speak literally face-to-face -face with God. And I personally think that what is being said in that text is, is that only once the glory of God had passed, and the very tiniest fragments of the trailing glory of God that would be bearable for Moses to look at, that he got to see. And it was some kind of physical manifestation of God. That's what he wanted to see for his reassurance. But God made clear to him, the real glory is that I am a merciful and patient and gracious God. And so he proclaims his name to Moses as he passed by the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, full of grace and truth, pardoning iniquity, transgression, and sin. He uses... Every English or every Hebrew word there is for forgiveness to describe himself. And it is very clear that God is wanting to know, be known by his people as this gracious and compassionate God. And so that phrase, slow to anger, that's the one that the translators <coughs> gave us long suffering. And that's more of a passive quality when you think about it. Someone suffering, someone is making you suffer, that is. They're doing things to you. And the natural thing we say is to retaliate or be provoked. Or, you know, let's, let's get our pound of flesh back from what they've done to us. Well, love doesn't do that. Because love is not focused on self, it's focused on what's good for the other person. And so, when it's not about us, we can let things go. And I would argue that all of these things love does not do, that's Paul's way of unpacking the long-suffering nature of love. Because love is long-suffering, it doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. It doesn't do this over here. But then the counterpart to that is the more active quality, which is kindness. And that is the active doing of good for people. And I think Paul unpacks that when he talks about the old things that uh, love bears and trusts and hopes. So that's the good that love does. And of course, it's not an exhaustive list. And so this is 
the God that we serve, a God who's the very embodiment of love. It, it's Paul's way of saying, without mentioning God directly, that if you want to love, you need to love like God loves. And as John put it in 1 John chapter 4, not once but twice in verse 8, and again in verse 16, God is love. Well, what does that mean? What's the content of that? Well, it means God suffers long. It means God does good for his people. Not, again, in a parochial sense, God does good for everybody. And in particular, in regard to his mercy. That in Jesus Christ, God has already offered forgiveness to every sinner. Even by we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Where do you see anywhere in the Bible a greater depiction of suffering long? And what greater good has God ever done for any human being that's ever walked the planet? But to not give them what they deserve, but to give them grace, mercy, patience, forgiveness. So this is the God that we're talking about. And so what do we do with this? Because clearly... The issue here is we are called to be kind. I think we understand God is kind. Even in the New Testament, that is said on numerous occasions. You know, Romans chapter 2, Paul asks the reader, Do you think lightly of the kindness of God? You know, it's there for your salvation. Uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, a great passage where he talks about how we're dead in our trespasses and our sins because of the riches of his kindness. Again, his mercy, his forgiving nature that we have been forgiven in Christ. Let us read one more of these New Testament passages. Notice in Titus chapter 3, and we'll pick up in verse 4, having just said that we were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, when this goodness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so it isn't just all throughout the Old Testament that God has described as kind and the, the, the kindness of God, the goodness of God and that he does for his people mentioned over and over again. But we see that's the focus here in the New Testament. But that, that's really the key that we come to in the fruit of the Spirit because the Spirit possesses these attributes. These are the various dimensions of God's character. Now we could very simply say God's character is love. Because it is the preeminent attribute. As a matter of fact, I would understand that what Paul's saying in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, that beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I think that's his way of saying that love is the one virtue that is the umbrella that covers all the others and glues them together. And that's why the great commandment is to love. And Paul said not once but twice in Romans 13 and here in Galatians 5, that if there's any other commandment besides love your neighbor as yourself, it's found in that commandment. And that is clearly to say that we understood what it means to love the other person, that that's why we are humble, that's why we are forgiving, that's why we are patient, it's why we are kind and do good for people. It's why we do anything. It's why we stay away from lying and adultery and stealing and murder. Because love is what it's all about. But instead of Paul just writing to the Corinthians to say, love one another, he felt the need to unpack that to some extent. And all those things love does not do, they pretty much were guilty of every one of those things. Don't do that! And so what does it mean to suffer long? What does it mean to be patient? What does it mean to be humble? What does it mean to actively, positively do good for others? And we can get some content of that in the realm of the idea, but some of that content's going to come from being aware of what's going on in our society. That gets back to 
Well, is rewinding a tape a kind act or an unkind act? Well, in our context, that was an act of kindness. Holding the door for somebody. Well, I think in our culture, that's still an act of kindness. You're doing good for somebody. Um, but that, again, calls for being aware in your society, how do we show goodness? What deeds are perceived as good? And I don't think it's that hard to figure out because you go back to the golden rule, just treat other people the way you want to be treated. If this is an act that you would perceive as kind or good, then it's probably an act that others will perceive as kind and good as well. Now, there's some limitations to that. You get in a culture that's so depraved that it calls evil good and good evil, there's going to be a lot of confusion. And you'll be accused of being a, a foe of some kind or hating people and so on. You're intolerant. Uh, that's just the nature of, of reality sometimes. You know, the early Christians, they were convicted as criminals because they would not comply with their society and obey the laws of the government that were contrary to those of God. And we understand that. But generally speaking, people understand what it means to be kind. And even if we are forced in, under certain circumstances not to conform our behavior to that which the world says is good, and we are guilty and branded as people that are evil according to the standards of this world, there will still be those areas of life that they'll look at and say, well, they are acting on principle. They really are doing this because they are convicted that this is wrong, and they can't go along with it. Because in these other areas, they are acting in a way that shows kindness. Again, the early Christians went through that. You know, with all the bad things that were said about them, that when the plague broke out in the city of Rome, and all the pagans fled the city so they wouldn't catch it, it's the Christians that stayed back and mocked the brows of the, their pagan neighbors who had ridiculed and mocked them and turned them into the authorities. That made quite an impression. Because those were acts of kindness. They were doing good for others and it was perceived that way. And so we are called to be kind, like God is kind. So these attributes of the divine character, these, these attributes of God's spirit, are to be produced in our own life. Love, joy, peace. All these relational virtues, how we're going to get along with one another. And so what I would argue, of course, is what we're being told to do is to do good for other people. However, that might show itself. Now, I think James chapter 2 is a good example of the kind of thing we're talking about. Uh, you may know the story that James is uh, concerned about some attitudes among his readers that, uh, you know, they weren't quite getting it. You know, the early part of the chapter, you know, if I were making a movie of this, I would, I would have these people coming to church, and the whole sermon was an unpacking of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. I had the scripture reading. Someone gets out there and reads, oh, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the songs, you know, were about loving our neighbor. And, and in the very process of having this religious assembly, in which we're studying about loving our neighbor and worshiping God about that, in the very act of doing that, we're showing prejudice toward a rich person and against a poor person. James, you can't do that. That's evil. And so as he continues to develop this, he talks about faith, what real trust does. It must demonstrate itself in our practical day-to-day -day life. Because if we say this is our most deeply held value, this is, this is what we commit our life to, it's what our entire life revolves around, this, but then it makes no difference in our life. It doesn't, there's no change. Well, that's clearly not the real trust. That's not the real value by which we're living. And so any kind of faith that has no manifestation, there, there's no acts, uh, no behavior that demonstrate that conviction. It, it's not genuine. And he gives as an example of this, in verse 15, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? 
In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Now, we're not told exactly how these people talked when they answered the door. And it's possible they were just as hateful and nasty and, you know, just venom dripping from their fangs, you know. But what if they said, oh, I just feel so sorry for you. Here you are, you don't have enough clothes to wear, it's freezing outside, and you haven't eaten in two weeks. Oh, that's just terrible. Oh, I really wish I could help you. Is that person kind? Sound kind. Don't sound mean. Don't sound hateful, nasty. They're being very nice, very gentle. They're not doing any good. And so we don't seem to have to answer the door, you know, Burns every God and Mother, let's break the shotgun. <laughs> Oh, that wouldn't be kind. <laughs> it might be more kind than the other. Did you do any good for them? That's the question. And we need to do good. That's the point. And so we, not only do we need to be doing good, but we need to be doing good the way God does good. And, of course, we've already made the point. Everything God does is good. Everything we should do should be good. And it should be for the good of others, not so much preoccupied on what's good for me. What's good for God and his cause and purpose in this world? And what is good for my neighbor? But just as the greatest good that God has ever done for anyone is to be merciful, so also the greatest good we can do for anyone is to be merciful. And that's the same point that's made repeatedly in the New Testament. And so notice in Ephesians chapter 4, at the end of that passage, the end of that chapter, very similar to what Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 31, he says, All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander must be removed from you, along with all malice. You know, it's the getting rid of the garbage part of it. But getting rid of the garbage isn't enough. That's like the uh, evil spirit that's cast out, but then you don't replace it with anything. And so more evil spirits will come back and occupy it. And so be kind to one another. Or we could very well translate that, do good for one another. Be compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And that's a manifestation of love, just as he goes on to say in the next two verses uh, there in chapter 5. And in Colossians chapter 3, we find another example of this. Uh, most of the time we have a parallel between Ephesians and Colossians. And he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, we should not lie to one another, since we laid aside the old self of its evil practices. This is the image of clothing. So our clothes are ragged and dirty, and we take them off, and we now have a new set of clothing that we put on. We put on this new self, we clothed ourselves with a new person that is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the Creator, that is Christ. And so we are we remain in the image of Christ. And so what does that look like? Well, he tells us in verse 12. So, as those who have been chosen of God, only beloved, put on. Well, wait a minute, Paul. You already told us what to put on. Put on the image of Christ. Here he's given us some content again. What is the image of Christ? Heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There again, you see kindness and gentleness are distinguished from one another. The doing of good for others is a manifestation of the character of Christ and the love of Christ. And he describes again in verse 13, putting up with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And so we must be kind as God is kind. To me, that's the key. Uh, I made a mistake many years ago as a young Christian. And I thought the Bible said, be humble. Love people. Be forgiven. Be kind. Be patient. And the problem is, the Bible doesn't say that. And the difference that makes in your life is, 
And forgive like Christ forgives. And love like Jesus loves. So how many days do you think I went to bed and I checked all those things? Not a single one. I don't throw up my hands and quit because that still has to be the goal. That is still what God deserves. He deserves nothing less than perfect obedience. But until I arrive there, I ain't arrived there. And if the Apostle Paul can say in Philippians chapter 3 that I have not yet achieved this spiritual resurrection, that God's not finished with this renewal process and remaking me in the image of Christ, I certainly have not gotten there yet. And it's a testimony to how kind God is. Because he is patient. He is forgiving and merciful. And so I'm not asking you to be kind tonight. I'm asking you to be kind like Jesus is kind. And to follow him in that kindness. And I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and address one final thing that I think lots of people miss the boat on, unfortunately. And I've already suggested that kindness is the more active quality, but positively it's doing a good for others, right? And that correlates with the end here where actively what love does is delight in the truth. And in particular, all things, love bears, endures. All things, love trusts or believes. All things, love hopes. All things, love endures. You talk about a verse that can be so easily misconstrued. Love believes everything. <laughs> what? Every lie that some... Idiot comes up and tells you, you just say, oh, I don't believe it. <laughs> and the next guy comes along and tells you something completely contradictory. Oh, I believe that too. Isn't love wonderful? That is not what this is talking about. You will notice that the first and last elements of these four all things have to do with endurance. They're basically synonyms making the same point. Love sticks with it. And that is a focus on the present. Right now, what do I need to be doing? I need to stick with it. Don't give up. And the two internal elements there are focused on the future. Because that's where trust and hope reside. And of course, there's a connection here. Because the only way you're going to have the power to get through anything is that you have confidence there's a future. And so when you don't see things going your way, you don't feel like, well, i got to take things into my own hands. God's letting things get off the rails. God doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe there is no God after all. No. The point here is your trust and hope are in God. And that's what keeps you going. And the all things here isn't literally like a direct object. You believe everything that comes along. You put your hope and confidence in everything that comes along. It means always, in every circumstance, in every circumstance, love will endure. Love will not give up. And if it does, it ain't love. And in every circumstance, always, God is the source of our hope and our trust. And it is ultimately our love for God and our love for others that will keep us going. And so I might paraphrase what Paul's saying here is love keeps doing good because love keeps trusting and hoping in God. So once again, he is the source of our kindness. And we only know kindness because we've seen it in God. We only know how to do good for others truly because we have seen the good that God has done for us. Well, we're going to sing an invitation song here. And as we do so, we can think about this Jesus, this Jesus that we come to remember every Sunday in the Lord's Supper. I often ask people, you know, those that have fancy writing inscribed on their table. I don't know if you have any fancy writing on y'all's table. This do in remembrance of me, or the shorter version, you know, in remembrance of me. And I ask people, what's the most important word? And it's the word me. You know, not referring to Tom Hamilton, but the one who spoke those words, Jesus. The Jesus you're thinking about makes all the difference in the world. And if this Jesus is just a figment of your imagination, what difference does it make? But which Jesus? This Jesus who came and lived 
a human life. The creator himself who came into his creation and suffered, and he denied himself, and he sacrificed himself in order to serve people who didn't deserve it. And that's one important element of all of this, to talk about loving as Jesus loves and being kind like Jesus is kind. Whether people deserve it or not cannot enter into the picture. Because we didn't deserve it. And yet the Lord is still kind and good to us. But there's one final passage that uses this word kind. And it's not going to show up in your translation. In Matthew chapter 11, a very famous passage at the end of that chapter about coming to Jesus to find rest. Verse 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You might suspect it's that word gentle there that is the word kind, no. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's that word easy. It's translated easy. But Jesus quite literally says that his yoke is kind. And again, that takes us kind of back to the beginning. This yoke is useful. I'm not saying it's, it doesn't exist. You, you won't even know that it's there. There is some work involved in following Jesus. There is some sacrifice. It can be hard. And we can't soft sell people in the gospel and make it sound like, oh, it's going to be very simple. But it is useful. And compared to the unrest, that we will have without God's forgiveness, without the yoke of Christ. It's a case where being a slave of Christ 